Hey, what's going on, folks? Um, today we're going to talk about the commonplace. We're going to look at um, this concept of theme, as the commonplace is a um, basically a synonym for theme, and how you can leverage it in your writing. Um, and while a theme could be something pretty subtle and a poem could have multiple themes, a commonplace is explicitly something um, that the reader is going to recognize and be familiar with, um, where you're kind of inviting the reader onto shared territory as a writer. Okay, and let's look at this Wordsworth poem to get the party started with stepping westward. What? Are you stepping westward? Yay! T'would be a wildish destiny if we, who thus together roam in a strange land and far from home, were in this place the guests of chance, who would stop or fear to advance, though home or shelter he had none, with such a sky to lead him on. The dewy ground was dark and cold, behind all gloomy to behold, and stepping westward, seemed to be a kind of heavenly destiny. I'd like the greeting. T'was a sound of something without place or bound and seemed to give me spiritual right to travel through that region bright. The voice was soft, and she who spake was walking by her native lake. The salutation had to me the very sound of courtesy. Its power was felt, and while my eye was fixed upon the glowing sky, the echo of the voice and wrought a human sweetness with the thought of traveling through the world that lay before me in my endless way. Now look at this here. Looky, looky here, huh? And stepping westward seemed to, westward seemed to be a kind of heavenly destiny, right? See how in the right here, uh, Wordsworth is unveiling this commonplace for us, right? Making it explicit. The great 20th century critic Donald Davey says this poem is about wanderlust. He says that it's that's its commonplace, which remember basically just means theme. Now different people could call it different things. Um, you might not call wanderlust. You might say the poem is about discovery or exploration or day tripping. But wanderlust seems to work pretty damn well, right? arose by any other name, so to speak. For Davy, these commonplaces are repositories of prefab plans for a poem that experienced readers are already familiar with. They're like poem templates. Davy actually likes that this Wordsworth poem is self-conscious in these lines here about what it's doing, about that's using this commonplace. Wordsworth acknowledges it in this poem as this kind of traditional sentiment that many people have year after year, time after time, as they go out for a walk. Um, but yet it arises in the poem spontaneously out of the action and chance meeting with the woman, allowing the speaker to kind of contemplate and really just poeticize. In other words, Wordsworth was not trying to put his finger on some part of human feeling or the soul that nobody has ever explored before. He's trying to return some aspect of the soul to its environment embodied in the natural world that his poem observes and recreates. Now, that's a big part of the whole romantic project, right? Um, so, but let's move forward. Let's go to modernism. Davy compares this poem to one of Ezra Pound's efforts, which he feels has the exact same commonplace, Wanderlust. Um, this poem is The Gypsy. Uh, now, just a brief time out here to say, um, you know, uh, this poem is a little bit offensive and we'll, we'll get into some of the challenges that I have with this poem. Um, and because it refers to Romani as gypsies, which today is recognized as a racial slur, I apologize to my Romani friends around the world. Um, but let's let's move on. Let's look at look at the poem. OK. The gypsy there was on top of the walk. That was, see, got to put on my glasses. Excuse me. That was the top of the walk when he said, have you seen any others, any of our lot with apes or bears? A brown upstanding fellow, not like the half castes up on the wet road near Claremont. 
The wind came and the rain and the mist clotted about the trees in the valley. And I had the long ways behind me, gray Aries and Biacare. I think it's Biacare. And he said, have you seen any of our lot? Now, I'd seen a lot of his lot ever since Rodez coming down from the fair of St. John with caravans, but never an ape or bear. So yeah, it's, you know, kind of crazy racist, right? The racist part is kind of so stitched into the poem, you can't separate it out. It's sentiment of wanderlust others and denigrates the Romani, the wandering race, who are contrasted with the glorious troubadour place names that litter the poem because he's, he's traveling in Aquitaine in southern France. Thus, Pound goes much further than Wordsworth, than Wordsworth and Wordsworth's traditional sentiment and kind of lends this idea of wandering this primitive atavistic element. That's heightened by the dreamlike mist clotted about the trees in the valley, as you can see here. Um, and it's that's devastatingly timed in the palm overrunning its line. And, you know, I hate it as much as you do that it's a fine palm, since in many ways it's kind of evil, but we still have to admire its craftsmanship and its use of the commonplace. The contrast between the troubadours on one hand and the Romani on the other disturbs me, but you and I can use Poundian techniques to do good in the world and make palms of subtle contrast that aren't racist. Um, Look at how he alludes to Wordsworth's piece, um, and I had the long way behind me, which is almost exactly what Wordsworth says as, as they're walking along, right? I also have to credit Pound for this great dismount at the end, right? Um, it's this poem of musical caroscuro, um, but it ends with this tone of self-depreciation or self-deprecation. So it's, it's not all high church modernism here. The poem does sneer, but it, at least it's not sneering sanctimoniously. All right, enough of Pound, okay? We're gonna go on to something published recently. Uh, I guess so recently you could say, you know, the ink is still dry by compare, uh, isn't dry, you know, by comparison, still wet. Um, and, um, you know, I think it's close enough. It's about two fellow travelers. So, you know, I don't know if it's explicitly about wanderlust or not, but, you know, fucking close enough what it looks like to us and the words we use. All these great bar barns out here in the outskirts, black creosote boards knee deep in the bluegrass. They look so beautifully abandoned, even in use. You say they look like arcs after the seas dried up. And I say they look like pirate ships and think of that walk in the valley where Jay said, you don't believe in God. And I said, no, I believe in this connection we all have to nature, to each other, to the universe. And she said, yeah, God. And how he stood there, low beasts among the white oaks, Spanish moss and spider webs, obsidian shards stuck in our pockets, woodpecker flurry, and I refused to call it so. So instead, we looked up at the unruly sky, its clouds and simple animal shapes we could name, though we knew they were really just clouds, disorderly and marvelous and ours. Oh, Ada Lamone. Oh, it's so skillful at the dismount. Mm, well, sticks to the landing. Not in a Poundian way, though. Not, not very self-deprecating there. What a grand gesture, though. Look at the commonplace, though. Stated rather baldly here on lines eight and nine. No, I believe in this connection we all have to nature, to each other, to the universe. Right? It's perfectly Wordsworthian. And just like Wordsworth, these lines are written to seem spontaneously offered by the speaker, even though it's contrived, deliberate, poetical speech. It feels like an outburst of the speaker's heart, but it's really a commonplace, right? And like Pound, Lamone effectively paints with the Spanish moss and white oaks and spider webs. Um, and then she pivots effectively to the clouds and sim simple animal shapes underscoring her poem's concern with how we label things and how we assign meaning, right? All this returns us to the commonplace, this concept of commonplace that she so well understands and leverages. A poem that's unafraid of precedent, unafraid to welcome the reader into a common ground. 
So she doesn't care if a topic has been already been written about by someone else. She's like, well, I, that doesn't bother me. I'm, I'm either going to do it better um, or um, I'm at least going to do it differently. I'm going to bring a new perspective to something that's been tried often before. I'm going to make it new, as Pound would say, right? Um, and in this way, once she's drawn the reader in and situated the reader in this common frame, then she can do introduce this whole litany of images, you know, these pirate ships, these arcs, um, you know, these obsidian shards, all these things that seem to allude to different things, to elements of history or, or religion or poetry that it's hard for us to paraphrase. So the commonplace, you can build these poems of levels and you can bring in readers with different needs and different levels of experience. So it's a really, really powerful technique I want you to consider for your own work. As a final note, I got the idea of this episode while reading a fantastic book of criticism from Robert Pinsky called Landor's Poetry, published in 1968. Pinsky deserves the shout out for showing me Davies' take on Pound and Wordsworth. Thank you, Dr. Pinsky for illuminating a path for me and so many other poets to follow.